Oh, Kraken God, it's Elijah. I've been thinking a lot about like my transition and like how I've had so many issues with my transition. Like, so this is something I have been dealing with and struggling with recently and talking to different people who are experiencing the same thing, the same feelings. You guys see it all over my channel, like, it, it's some real shit, guys, and I don't know. I just been thinking about it a lot, and I do regret transitioning. Mama, I know I'm a demon. It ain't nothing she can do but pray for me. Yes, this, all of this. Um, I think a lot of my followers know this. I transitioned for about four years. Um, I never got around to the medical side because I was underage, but I did experience life socially transitioned um, as male. And I do not regret that at all. Um, whilst I regret the, the negative ideas I had about myself during that time and the trauma that I had that led to it, I don't, I don't regret my transition at all. I think it was actually really important to my understanding of myself now and I can't imagine my life had I not gone through that. I think that centering regret in detransitioning conversations is really harmful to the trans community because it gives a platform to people who are like, oh, you'll regret this. And it's also just harmful in general. You don't have to regret everything that's happened in your life that you were wrong about. Just move on. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. You know, my upbringing was pretty much a typical California upbringing um, in, in Los Angeles in the early 40s. It wasn't really anything remarkable. At least not until uh, my dad began to take me over and drop me off at my grandma's house. That woman. I thought that becoming a woman would make me happy. It would be a different life. I would have these lovely flouncy dresses on and I'd be skipping through the tulips and stuff like that. It wasn't. I'm speaking the absolute truth about this because people need to know what it's really like having been there and been there myself. Um, this is a very difficult topic, as people have noted, and I'm here to address it from a very personal point of view. As a child, I was a transgender kid. I was insistent, persistent, and consistent. I hated myself as a girl, and I did everything I could to present as a boy. You know, I kind of keep saying I wish this was talked about more. It kind of bring up uh, just some stuff around surgery and regret feelings and um, that I've talked about here a few different times. So I'm someone who's had bottom surgery a few years ago now. Um, I lived as a trans woman for six years and I decided about three months ago that this road isn't going to take me where I need to go, that I, uh, it, it was creating more problems than it was solving and that I really wanted to get to know myself outside of that particular gender. Procedure I had in Europe in October of 2021. So I reported in my previous videos that I have to wear male diapers because the urethra is leaking. That has improved but very slightly. Uh, so that's the reason I'm being dramatic. I've got a package of diapers here. This is what a male diaper looks like. I didn't feel any different inside. I didn't feel like a woman. I was not happy. I was lonely. I was going to commit suicide over this. And I became very curious about her work. And my curiosity led to her making me a purple chiffon dress that she made just to fit my perfect little four-year-old body. You know, at first it felt really exciting to have somebody telling me how wonderful and cute I was. But what I didn't realize was happening is the second grandma began to tell me how cute I looked in that purple dress, what she was really saying was that there was something radically wrong with the little boy that I really was. Nine years old, I was raped by one of my father's employees, which caused a lot of confusion in my mind. 
um, I would ask myself, why do men want to have sex with me? And when he told me he would kill me if I said anything. To share my story, that I was born a biological male, and I made a horrible, tragic mistake in 2006. I had my male genitals removed. I was not very mentally and emotionally well. I didn't have proper mental health training when um, I was abused as a little boy. So that I could have at least seen this possibility and these stories when I was younger and when I was going through everything at that point. Um, and it could have possibly prevented what I'm struggling with now. And I'm speaking about this today because there are thousands of parents and detransitioners who would like to speak out about this. But those stories don't exist for people to hear unless we make them the people who are experiencing this but who can't because they're being bullied or they're being um, told that they'll lose their job. They're being deplatformed. I'm Kat and I detransitioned because transitioning harmed my health as well as my career. It is of vital importance that people hear stories like mine, but TikTok banned me just for daring to challenge the dominant narrative. I'm speaking on their behalf and on my behalf as that little girl who was transgender. Even if social media companies try to censor us and throw us under the bus, detransitioners refuse to be silent. And so thankful that I wasn't put on puberty blockers to retard my growth and development. I wasn't put on cross-sex hormones that would permanently damage my body with the combination of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones that would have sterilized me. And yes, that combination, if given prepubescently, does result in sterility. It's a closed society. People don't want to know. They make it glam they glamorize it. It isn't glamorous at all. For uh, phalloplasty, um, I had my first uh, detransition surgery. Um, when the breast tissue got removed, that was back in um, July of 2016. And, um, to get my male members rebuilt, um, as I'm a biological male, made a tragic mistake in 2006 and had my male um, genitalia mutilated. And so that begins this sort of creepy kind of psychological and emotional destruction that starts with inside a young boy, four years old, who doesn't know what the consequences are gonna be about putting on a dress at four years old and keeping it a secret from my parents for nearly two years until I became so accustomed to wearing that purple dress that I decided to take the dress home so that I could put it on when my parents weren't watching or when I was alone and I could sort of listen and hear those affirmations. I became sort of addicted to the affirmations and hearing her say how cute I was. Living in the, the shame and the victim role anymore because I just played that fiddle um, or violin and poor little old Daniel, you know, he was abused as a little boy for a long time. And so I'm having to finally grow up, come out of that, but I don't want to um, um, not spread the message about sex chain surgeries are radical invasive procedures on your body. You have absolutely no idea what's going to happen. So, I kind of regret top surgery, um, and maybe more than kind of. I'm not gonna like detransition or anything like that, but it made my life like so hard. I had top surgery um, in 2015 when I, w I was it was a month before I turned 17. And like so many awkward things happening and so much like work and effort towards something that like I'm just, it's just not working out, you know? Um, I did have a particularly not so great dilation session about a week ago that led to 
an infection or things smelling not that great and just stinging and pain and it really drove home a feeling I've had a lot last few years which is this is making it much harder for me to feel comfortable connecting with people you could uh, one person that I know um, had the male to female surgery they went all the way through when they created the vaginal canal for that transsexual person actually feeling open to that I I don't know if I even want to go through that because I feel so scared of what how people might judge me or relate to me I don't know what's going on but um, you know they were in the hospital for a long time because of that and they had to do multiple corrective surgeries and so I feel like I am called to speak for all of these detransitioners and parents because they are afraid to speak yeah, unfortunately, I'm not really active on TikTok anymore because I'm currently banned. And the fact that they're afraid to speak needs to tell us something. But yeah, just just the negativity and like thousands of hateful comments um, a day, it's... They're afraid to come up here and tell their, their authentic story of having been trans-identified and detransitioning and being bullied and being um, abused and losing their friends and losing their jobs and facing threats of violence. So I had the purple dress at home, but my mom found it, found it in my bottom dresser drawer. And she said, well, where did you get this dress? And I said, well, grandma made it. And that just blew the house up. And this went on for a period of two years. And then shortly after that, my parents had gone through a divorce and then I eventually would move to Portland, Maine, uh, I think the age of 17. But as a couple of years went by, I was in Daring Oaks Park, and I had met some men there, and they invited me to do some drinking with them. And I did, and I, they invited me back to their apartment, and I was right by all four of them. Dad didn't know what to do. His mother-in-law had just been cross-dressing his young boy. He was so angry at my grandmother that he took his anger out in his discipline on me, and he started hitting me with a hardwood floor plank. These are often children who, like me, were traumatized as children. The reason I developed a transgender identity is that I was sexually assaulted as a child. Uh, repeatedly, one after the other. And I had met a couple of transsexuals in this gay bar, and they would just say things like, you're so pretty, you know, you should you're too pretty to be a boy. During that sexual assault, my brain came up with the idea that if I was a boy, that would never happen to me again. Uh, you should start female hormones. And of course I would chew on those things that they spoke to me. And that is why I decided I wasn't gonna be a girl anymore. Oh. Um, anyway, um, I had my vaginal canal that um, I had created in 2006 uh, reversed and, and sewn back up in a um, metoidioplasty in 2020, uh, October 2020, and then I was, uh, um, one year later, had the phalloplasty. So I still have to go back for uh, urethral lengthening to fix this urinary problem that I have from the leaking uh, urethra. And like other detransitioners have had surgery, they've had organs removed, like some of them have to be on HRT um, for the rest of their lives. This isn't expressing some part of me. This is just the results of some action I took that I thought was going to help and didn't. Um, so I was pretty young. It really wasn't even two years between actually knowing I was non-binary and getting top surgery. Hard for me to project my voice. It's still hard for me to sing. It's a lot harder for me to sing than it used to be. You know, it is because of how it's affected my voice. And, and that was a huge thing that I had to grieve. And like other detransitioners have had surgery. They've had organs removed. Like some of them have to be on HRT. Um, for the rest of their lives. And it's like, for someone to just then tell you, well, you're just cis, like your experience doesn't count. You're not oppressed at all.
like especially with with these transitioners who have gone so far that they actually do appear more like the other sex you know and have to detransition from that i mean for one thing like the services aren't covered um the surgeries aren't covered anymore at that point by insurance i just like pretty much wish that i just never found out that like it was an option you know i hated myself i hated what happened and i was convinced the only way i could keep myself safe is to be a boy and i'm not the only one but the next part of the equation was his adopted brother, Uncle Fred, heard about me wearing the purple dress, and Uncle Fred decided that I was fair game to be sexually abused. And when I was real, real young, even under nine years old, I forgot to mention that my mother used to speak over me. She'd always said, Jeffrey, you should have been born a girl instead of a boy. And when somebody says that to you, you know, you, sh you should have been born a girl and not a boy. Um, I mean, it... it you just live with rejection, you know what I mean? I've talked to hundreds of detransitioners who've had similar stories of sexual assault. I talked to my dear friend, Billy Burley, who went through the full medical transition. And he finally realized his hatred for his penis that he had cut off was the result of a sexual assault by a swim coach. Uncle Fred was not playing with a full deck of cards and he'd get a, drinking a little bit and he would come looking for me and he would molest me. The emotional and psychological issues that I had from grandma affirming me, I didn't really realize the consequence of those for many years. So when I'd be off playing, I always hear a voice saying, well, even your mother thinks you should have been born a girl. Um, and the turmoil and torment in my mind got so bad that I just accepted it. The hardwood floor plank obviously was very devastating. And then the sexual abuse was sort of the cherry on top of the, the cake. I was a broken child before I was 10 years old. I was so sick and tired of the turmoil in my mind, of hearing those voices, those lies in my mind. You're a girl. You should have been born a girl. I was so sick of it uh, that I actually just came into agreement with it. Now when these kids come forward and they say they feel better, when they, they transition, I am so sure they do. I am not discounting what they say. I'm not trying to erase their pain. I'm not trying to be hateful. You know, I, I decided that maybe I should have been a girl, not realizing that, that what I was trying to do was escape the abuse, not actually change who I was. But it resulted in me going through this process for many years of cross-dressing, going out in public as a female, I want to be compassionate and loving to these kids who are struggling with such intense feelings. These feelings of gender dysphoria are real. But rather than telling the child that they're inherently flawed and that they're born in the wrong body, and the only way that they can survive themselves is to basically kill who they are and become another person. That's a horrible message to give to any child. And top surgery was also something I was not sure about. I knew that I had dysphoria over um, kind of how I presented and was perceived by others um, with that chest. I just like don't feel like good or tidy or prepared or healed or whole. I, I feel vulnerable. It feels like this expression of the vulnerability of inadequacy. Especially a child who's endured some kind of trauma like I did. Because if I had been given that message, I would have continued to believe that that sexual assault was my fault and that the only way to stay safe is to be a boy. I said, you're right, I am. So I got into booze and I was introduced to prostitution and some drugs, cocaine, and started female hormones at the same time all around the age of 18 and 19 years old. And so I, I went through this with, even in my first marriage, I had two children. I was an executive for 
American Honda Motor Company. I worked on the Apollo space missions as an associate design engineer, but that purple dress, the hardwood floor plank, and the sexual abuse was about to take everything away. And I don't know, it's just hard to... I wish I could just jump back and claim a male-bodied but kind of femme, weirdo, queerdo vibe and have sex with different people and have like a penis and, you know... I wish I could just do that and l learn and grow from that point. Not, I was, I guess this work about how my body took up space, having that chest, and not about my body itself as its own natural thing and state. In addition, testosterone is a controlled substance, and it would make any single female in here, if we start taking it, feel like a million bucks. We should not be giving children controlled substances, steroids, in order to make them feel better when they're struggling with mental health issues. And the next critical step was struggling with my identity. I went to a gender specialist in San Francisco who promptly identified me with gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder and promptly told me that I needed hormones and surgery. And this has become a political ideology. It's almost akin to a state-sponsored religious belief that a child can somehow be born in the wrong body. That's a mystical view, not a medical view. That was the treatment that he was prescribing to help me end the cycle of distress I was having about my gender because of what happened to me as a young child. So it was kind of a decision I struggled with a little bit, um, just because I had those conflicting thoughts and feelings. And that wasn't something I really talked with anybody about. The doctor I went to, his name is Dr. Paul Walker. Dr. Paul Walker was a homosexual transgender activist. And I honestly don't think I was at an age where I was able to fully, like truly understand and take in all the different aspects of that. He felt his job was to do like they're doing today, is to introduce people to hormones and surgery as a process of treatment. Like, I think that if I were to go back in time and like, I would have never found out about it, I didn't know it was an option, like I wouldn't have, obviously I wouldn't have transitioned. Because if I had been given that message, I would have continued to believe that that sexual assault was my fault and that the only way to stay safe is to be a boy. Like, I definitely, I obviously realized at a surface level, like, yeah, there's a chance I could regret this. There's a chance that anybody could regret something down the line. Um, but I was just so sure that that wasn't the case and so sure that, like, this is how I feel, so this is my truth. In addition, Testosterone is a controlled substance, and it would make any single female in here, if we start taking it, feel like a million bucks. We should not be giving children controlled substances, steroids, in order to make them feel better when they're struggling with mental health issues. As impossible as it feels now, as sure in your identity as you are now, until you can recognize the chance that that might not always be the case and that this might end up having consequences for you later down the road was an accept that like like wow i i like i really liked it i'm just like it just just doesn't feel I don't know how to do this, you know? And that is really scary that I can't see the rest of my life right now and I can't know. And I don't know how everything is gonna play out and that's scary. And I'm so afraid to feel these feelings. And it got so bad that I actually had a nervous breakdown in a nightclub one night and just started smashing my fist on a car. <clears throat> and then uh, shortly after this, I'm trying to not cry. And think about it.
dating or connecting with people because I don't want to make I don't know I just I don't want to be rejected for that or have that be a reason that things don't work out so anyway I'd had several videos that got taken down for violating community guidelines and um you know it was it was stuff that was gender critical but you know I wouldn't say we know you're very upset I mean honestly I'm not really I'm not really that upset right now <laughs> um you know I mean I'm yeah I, I I'm disappointed but I feel like I've been handling it like pretty well <laughs> like I've, I've had a full day of school today and you know I feel relatively calm like to feel it and it got put back right like usually pretty quickly it would get restored um you know like if you detransition it's just it's no big deal right just like take more hormones get more surgeries um you're just on a journey like i'm sorry but i just hate that so much like i mean you know i, I won't like say anybody else's perspective uh it's only a matter of time till you get banned i hope not i love your videos so much a swags like you are hilarious um but yeah, I mean, so I'm just thinking about the strategy, like going forward, I, I don't know if I'm going to make another TikTok account. Come to my blog through the contact form, a teenager. And that are like talking about detransitioning and stuff in the same way that I am. Like a lot of them are put the spin on it. Like it's just my journey and all of that. Um, you know, like if you detransition, it's just, it's no big deal, right? Just like take more hormones get more surgeries um you're just on a journey like i'm sorry but i just hate that so much like i mean you know I, I won't like say when i'm being bullied and i'm getting like thousands hundreds to thousands of hateful comments like every day and including death threats oh thank you i did i did actually appeal um so you know we'll see what they say you know, I'm someone who's, who was cyber bullied as a teenager when I struggled with having an eating disorder. Um, I, I got bullied for having an eating disorder. And so that was like a trauma that I had as a teenager. And um, so just, you know, I, I definitely didn't take it in and let it affect me in the same way that I did back then. But just having like hundreds of people tearing your tearing down your appearance, like, day after day, sending death threats, saying you're stupid, you're ugly, um, just all of that. It just, <laughs> it did make me feel like I'm just like a high school kid again, or like even a junior high school kid, like these people's tactics, I mean, a lot of them are like literally like 13 years old <laughs> or 15 years old. And so I'm literally like twice these people's age, right? Um, but yeah, like just when you check your notifications and it's just like, you're ugly, you're stupid. Um, you have a receding hairline <laughs> like that's one of the like stupidest ones um <clears throat> sorry uh I've, I've been like talking a lot today i had a creative writing class today and i was like like how traumatic it is and like when you look at the studies on transitioning and just the high dropout rates and you think about um Greetings, love your content. Thanks for sharing your thoughts and experiences. That's super brave. Thank you, Sabina. I appreciate that. So when it comes to detransitioners and like talking about your journey and, you know, I have not had surgery, right? I, I didn't do certain things that a lot of detransitioners have done. But even so, like, like the voice change for me and, and having to retrain my voice and like, it's still hard for me to project my voice. It's still hard for me to sing. It's a lot harder for me to sing than it used to be. And um, thank you, the blue exorcist. <laughs> um, so yeah, when I'm when I'm singing, it's like that's why I'm not posting music content like every day. I, I wish that I could, but my voice is too delicate now. I used to be able to sing for hours every day and I cannot do that anymore. I mean, that's partially why I you know, just talk about my experiences and share different kinds of content rather than music content. Um, you know, it is because of how it's affected my voice. And, and that was a huge thing that I had to grieve. And like other detransitioners have had surgery, they've had organs removed, like some of them have to be on HRT um, for the rest of their lives. And it's like for someone to just then tell you, well, you're just cis, like, 
your experience doesn't count, you're not oppressed at all. Like, especially with, with detransitioners who have gone so far that they actually do appear more like the other sex, you know, and have to detransition from that. I mean, for one thing, like, the services aren't covered. Um, the surgeries aren't covered anymore at that point by insurance. And so, you know, you have a body that is, and, and I don't mean to sound harsh, but, you know, it is mutilation in some cases. Like, uh, I mean, yes, the surgeries are, are body mutilation. And so you have a body that is like missing organs and it's, and then you're supposed to just say like, oh, it was all part of my journey. Like, I'm, I'm fine with this. You might have serious pain from like, the procedures that you've had done. And, and like I said, I haven't gone through that specifically, but I've just heard other detransitioners. Um, and um, no surgeon in the US or Canada wanted to touch me. So that's why I came to Europe. And um, I'm really grateful that this man is skilled, that he can, um, he uh, did the first surgery last year, uh, which is known as metoidoplasty closed the vaginal canal, inserted uh, prosthetic uh, testicles, and uh, uh, built a small uh, penis uh, and extended the urethra. That's a horrible disservice. We're basically encouraging them to dissociate, to run away from their feelings, to run away from themselves, and to take a drug that's going to, in the short term, help them to feel better. And in the long term, permanently damage their bodies and in the long term prevent them from getting the help that they need to understand the difficult feelings that they're having in the first place. And so sure that like this is how I feel so this is my truth and this is just what people do. This is like I'm transmasculine, I'm transitioning, I have dysphoria so the solution for that is to get top surgery and then I'll be happy. I want a flat chest. See, I have mental illness. I'm delusional. I run from pain. I run from problems. I'm a scared, frightened little boy, even though I'm now in my 60s. But it, it was really so much more complicated than that. And it wasn't something I was able to realize yet. But it is a really, really big decision. Um, and I think until you can recognize that and you can truly accept. I hear Dr. Liston and other doctors who talk about the medical expertise and the standards of care. And I want to acknowledge that, generally speaking, I have great respect for doctors. <laughs> However, they have gotten it wrong in the past. And this is one of those instances where they're getting it wrong. You have a body that is, and, and I don't mean to sound harsh, but, you know, it is mutilation in some cases. Like This is what a male diaper looks like. So if I don't put that in and I just use my underwear, my underwear gets soaked uh, over time. To engage in medical uh, interventions. That, that you know, puberty blockers, they block puberty. They're a developmental delay. They're retarding that child's growth and development. That's what they do. This is one of those instances, like the opioid epidemic, like thalidomide, like lobotomies, where doctors have gotten it terribly wrong, and where we have to stand up and put in some um, restrictions so that they can't keep providing this care to children when what these children really need is love and support. Uh, I mean, yes, the surgeries are, are body mutilation. And so you have a body that is like missing organs and... Um, and again, it's like, just even the idea of having a partner and just like dealing with any of your sexuality, like their libido, my libido, anyone's thing. It's like, I would just much rather have things be open, even though I'm not the most poly person personally, but it's, and then you're supposed to just say like, oh, it was all part of my journey. Like I'm, I'm fine with this. You might have serious pain from like the procedures that you've had done. Just so that I wouldn't have to think about, I, 
can feel it comfortable knowing that maybe I'm not at the place now to meet some of those needs or that I can feel comfortable at least as far as my own situation is going. I realized only in the last couple of years that I'm a lesbian. Um, no matter what, I'll be a pretty giving game person in other ways, but... Uh, I didn't know you could be non-binary and a lesbian. I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't know you could like other non-binary people and be a lesbian. I didn't know any of that. I kind of just wish I had my original chest, like my natural original body. I got married. Um, it'll be three years in May of 2022. It'll be three year anniversary. I've had to grow up a lot and um, I don't know y'all <laughs> it's uh it's hard I think that this is the this is like the stew of feelings that um that anyone who thinks about the path the transition or surgery wants to avoid right is making some choices that end up not feeling like the right choices and setting your life on a course that is different than the one that you wanted to set for yourself. This is not about erasing transgender children. This is about providing them the care that they need. This is anything but erasing them. This is the opposite of erasing them. Transing them is erasing them. If I had been trans, I wouldn't be here today as a woman and a mother and a wife and a daughter. I kind of just wish I had my original chest like my natural original body talking about detransitioning and stuff in the same way that i am like a lot of them are put the spin on it like it's just my journey and all of that um you know like if you detransition it's just it's no big deal right because i think um having breasts would for me um are kind of very important and tied to those feelings it's just that's just how it is for me I'm not saying that's how it is for others just like take more hormones get more surgeries um you're just on a journey like i'm sorry but i just hate that so much like when i'm with people um that's something that i think would be very intimate me and very like shared and special and I feel like lacking that chest um, means that my experiences with people and the people I'm you know with dating intimate with um, it lacks I wouldn't even have my beautiful children the fact that these children are going to have that choice taken away from them when they don't even have a sense of what it's like to be a grown-up. So when it comes to detransitioners and like talking about your journey and, you know, I have not had surgery, right? I, I didn't do certain things that a lot of detransitioners have done. But even so, like, like the voice change for me and, and having to retrain my voice and like it's still hard for me to project my voice. It's still hard for me to sing. It's a lot harder for me to sing than it used to be. So to put it in terms of this, these feelings of regret, and and I guess I bring up bitterness too, because for me, there's often this feeling of trying to be, understand this feeling of regret is happening, but also trying to ward against it, kind of calcifying into bitterness. I'm finally in the right skin and in the right place mentally because I've healed the underlying cause. Um, the, the sex change surgery is just a, a symptom of the big problem. And I can say that because I know from experience, I'm 28 years in substance abuse recovery in just a couple of more weeks or so. Um, and alcohol was just a symptom of the illness. You know, it's true that I feel fat sometimes and sometimes more than others that, you know, things have come to pass this way. Um, that my life isn't another life. Isn't a life where I made a different choice on surgery. And so uh, my appeal is if you're, um, 
if, if you're absolutely certain that, that you want to have a sex chain surgery, God be with you because, man, it's expensive. It's very painful. It did not fix my gender dysphoria problem. Um, so my chest now, and you know, it's not a bad chest. I like it. It's nice. Um, it's just, I wish I had my old chest. What very much feels like a stark difference between myself and partners, and that's coming from me. I feel um, sad. And then where bitters would come in is if it would feel that I ought to have had like more knowledge or more information. I got the wrong information. Somebody screwed me over because the trans rights movement screwed me over or medicalization or doctors screwed me over or whatever. Or um, because I, I did like my chest. Um, like unclosed, I like my chest it was I thought it was nice and I liked it but I didn't like how it made me feel outside of that small portion of just being alone with my own body not because I want to be here talking about this kind of pain that I have but to let you know that children are resilient and they can make it through these difficult feelings See, I have mental illness. I'm delusional. I run from pain. I run from problems. I'm a scared, frightened little boy, even though I'm now in my 60s. Um, they can survive whatever it is that's causing that dysphoria if they're supported, if they're not told they were born in the wrong body, if they're not encouraged to dissociate. Just existing as myself. Because so much of our life is not that. It's existing around other people. And that's where I was just work. And become a different person. So I ask you, don't erase these children with gender dysphoria. Love them and support them and care for them. Um, the, the sex change surgery is just a, a symptom of the big problem. And uh, I just kind of wish I hadn't. And I can't take that back. And I can say that because I know from experience, I'm 28 years in substance abuse recovery in just a couple of more weeks or so. Um, and alcohol was just a symptom of the illness. So that's the little cluster of regret that I'm dealing with lately that I've made peace that I have it. But it still sucks. This is heartbreaking to me, and that's why I'm here. Not because I want to be here telling you my story. <laughs> and like other detransitioners have had surgery, they've had organs removed. Like some of them have to be on HRT um, for the rest of their lives. And it's like for someone to just then tell you, well, you're just cis. Like your experience doesn't count. You're not oppressed at all. Lee. There's that real risk for us, right, of it really being like, you know, I was done wrong, you know? And, and it's totally reasonable to be angry and to be frustrated and all these things, absolutely. I'm hurt by everything that's, you know, happened in my healing. It, it's been such an expenditure of stuff and it's, it's just sad on some level. I wish it wasn't this way. But for me to accept that it would be unjust is for me to say that I deserved a certain clarity that I didn't get or something came to pass someone coerced me in a way that took that in a way that was that was um to hurt me and um thank you the blue exorcist <laughs> um so yeah when I'm when I'm singing it's like that's why I'm not posting music content like every day I I wish that I could but my voice is too delicate now I used to be able to sing for hours every day and I cannot do that anymore. I mean, that's partially why I, you know, just talk about my experiences and share different kinds of content rather than music content. Um, you know, it is because of... And, um, you know, it wasn't what I deserved. And I just think that there's only so much we can know 
in ourselves in our lives and and certainly for myself i've been trying to know and love myself and and if you asked me on the day i had my surgery my first surgery right before i had it do i feel like i'm going closer or more away from my mountain i would say closer i would say closer after every time i've ever acted in gender uh in surgery and all these things it's always been closer i remember actually I want us to think critically about which medical treatments are potentially withheld due to risk of regret and why. My partner and I are new parents to an eight month old baby. I had egg retrieval done years ago and we conceived our baby using IVF. I want to know the number of times that we were asked whether we've considered if we might regret having children. Beyond that, no one asked us to consider what it might be like to parent through a pandemic or other kind of, you know, social and economic stressors. This is really just a rhetorical exercise. A number of bioethicists have concluded that it's unethical to withhold medical treatments on the basis of a risk of regret. Let's talk about regret. I regret taking out $100,000 in loans for a three-year program full of TED Talks, sexual harassment, and physically debilitating stress. I had the right do that. I had the right to make that decision and to make the judgment throughout that experience that I wanted to stay. And the fact that afterwards, I wish I had made a different decision doesn't mean that it was wrong to let me. It was nobody's job to stop me from doing something I regretted. So when I see Yet another study written by a cisgender person who says that trans people should be stopped from getting health care lest they regret it. Yes, this, all of this. Um, I think a lot of my followers know this. I transitioned for about four years. Um, I never got round to the medical side because I was underage, but I did experience life socially transitioned um, as male. And I do not regret that at all. Um, whilst I regret the, the negative ideas I had about myself during that time and the trauma that I had that led to it, I don't, I don't regret my transition at all. I think it was actually really important to my understanding of myself now and I can't imagine my life had I not gone through that. I think that centering regret in detransitioning conversations is really harmful to the trans community because it gives a platform to people who are like, oh, you'll regret this. And it's also just harmful in general. You don't have to regret everything that's happened in your life that you were wrong about. Just move on. It's happened in your life that you were wrong about. Just move on.